U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken came out on stage to deliver a press conference in Geneva after talks with Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov. Take a listen. The NATO Russia Council and the OSCE on the crisis in Ukraine and broader European security issues. Our objective is to determine whether Russia is prepared uh, to take the diplomatic path and other necessary steps to de-escalate the situation in Ukraine and ultimately uh, to resolve our differences through diplomacy and through dialogue. The discussion today with Mr. Lavrov was frank and substantive. I conveyed the position of the United States and our European allies and partners that we stand firmly uh, with Ukraine in support of its sovereignty and territorial integrity. We've been clear. If any Russian military forces move across Ukraine's border, that's a renewed invasion. It will be met with swift, severe, and a united response from the United States and our partners and allies. We also know from experience that Russia has an extensive playbook uh, of aggression short of military action, including cyber attacks, paramilitary tactics, uh, and other means uh, of advancing their interests aggressively uh, without uh, overtly using military action. Those types of Russian aggression will also be met with a decisive, calibrated, and again, united response. That's the clear message coming out of my meetings on Wednesday in Ukraine with President Zelensky, Foreign Minister Kaleba, yesterday in Germany uh, with my counterparts from uh, Germany, the UK, uh, France, and the European Union, uh, and with uh, German Chancellor Schultz. We're united in our commitment to finding a way forward through diplomacy and dialogue, but equally in our resolve to impose massive consequences should Russia choose the path of confrontation and conflict. I expressed again to Minister Lavrov that on the security concerns that Russia has raised in recent weeks, the United States and our European allies and partners are prepared to pursue uh, possible means of addressing them in a spirit of reciprocity, which means, simply put, that Russia must also address our concerns. There are several steps that we can take, all of us, Russia included, to increase transparency, to reduce risks, to advance arms control, to build trust. I convey directly to Minister Lavrov our specific concerns for Russia's actions that challenge or undermine peace and security, not only in Ukraine, but throughout Europe and indeed in the world. I also laid out several ideas to reduce tensions and increase security, which we've developed in consultation uh, with our partners and allies, and where we believe we can find common ground, again, based on the principle of reciprocity. Uh, this was not negotiation but a candid exchange of concerns and ideas. I made clear to Minister Lavrov that there are certain issues and fundamental principles that the United States and our partners and allies are committed to defend. That includes those that would impede the sovereign right of the Ukrainian people to write their own future. There is no trade space there, none. Foreign Minister Lavrov and I also uh, uh, talked about uh, the, uh, the way forward. Um, let me say as well that he heard from us uh, and from me that uh, what is for us an inviolable rule, uh, nothing about Ukraine without Ukraine, nothing about NATO without NATO, nothing about Europe without Europe. Based on our discussion, uh, I believe uh, we can carry forward this work of developing understanding and agreements together that ensure our, our mutual security. But that's contingent on Russia stopping its aggression uh, toward Ukraine. So that's the choice that Russia faces now. It can choose the path of diplomacy that can lead to peace and security, or the path that will lead only to conflict, severe consequences, and international condemnation. The United States and our allies and partners in Europe stand ready to meet Russia on either path, and we will continue to stand with Ukraine. I believe that uh, Foreign Minister Lavrov now has a better understanding of our position uh, and vice versa. Today's discussion was useful in that sense, and that's precisely why we met. So I'll return to Washington uh, this afternoon to consult with President Biden and uh, our entire national security team, as well as members of Congress, and critically, allies and partners in the days ahead. Based on the discussions today, Foreign Minister Lavrov and I agreed that it's important for the diplomatic process to continue. I told him that following the consultations, 
uh, that we'll have in the coming days with uh, uh, allies and partners, we anticipate that we will be able to share with Russia our concerns and ideas in more detail and in writing next week. And we agreed to further discussions after that. We agreed as well that further diplomatic discussions uh, would be the preferable way uh, forward. Uh, but again, uh, it is really up to Russia to decide which path it will pursue. I should mention as well that the Foreign Minister and I had uh, an opportunity to discuss Iran, an example of how the United States and Russia can work together on security issues of shared concern. Uh, the talks with Iran about a mutual return to compliance with the JCPOA uh, have reached a decisive moment. If a deal is not reached in the next few weeks, Iran's ongoing nuclear advances will make it impossible to return the JCPOA. But right now, uh, there's still a window, a brief one, uh, to bring those talks to a successful conclusion and address the remaining concerns of all sides. We didn't expect any major breakthroughs to happen today, but I believe we are now on a clearer path uh, in terms of understanding uh, each other's concerns, each other's positions, Let's see what the next, uh, the next days bring. And with that, I'm happy to take your questions. Andrew Mitchell. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Uh, Mr. Lavrov has uh, spoken today about hysterical rhetoric, what he calls hysterical rhetoric from the West about an invasion he claims to provoke Ukraine. And President Biden said that with what has happened so far, that he believes that Putin will move in because he's got to do something. So uh, do you think, as of today, that you have a better understanding from Mr. Lavrov, first of all, of what Putin's intentions are? Do you have any commitment at all that they will stop the aggression that you say is standing in the way of any positive agreement? He says that you are going to present written responses, which you've just confirmed, but he wants them to be to his original proposals, which you and everyone in the administration has said from the beginning are non-starters, proposals to limit NATO expansion. So will your written answers have any different response to him about NATO expansion, uh, which you just said is, is nothing, is not negotiable? So where do you see a space for any kind of engagement to defuse this crisis? And as you, since you brought up Iran, do you think there is the possibility, after talking to Mr. Lavrov, that you and Russia, the US and Russia, and the other allies, can get Iran agreed to come into compliance, and will the US then agree to lift sanctions, perhaps simultaneously? Thanks very much, Andrea. First, uh, we're not proceeding on the basis of emotion. We're proceeding on the basis of fact and history. Uh, the facts are that Russia has amassed very significant forces uh, on Ukraine's border and continues to do so, uh, 100,000 troops, most recently including forces deployed to Belarus. Uh, that would give uh, Russia the capacity, if President Putin so chooses, to uh, attack Ukraine from the south, from the east, from the north. Uh, and we've seen plans to uh, undertake a variety of destabilizing actions, some of them short of the uh, overuse of uh, a force, to uh, destabilize uh, Ukraine, uh, to topple the government, uh, a variety of things. So uh, as I said, this is not on the basis of emotion. It's on the basis of fact and also history. Russia invaded Ukraine in 2014, seizing Crimea, uh, provoking an ongoing conflict in eastern Ukraine, the Donbass, changing Ukraine's borders by force. That's what we're looking at. Uh, we've heard Russian officials say that they have no intention of invading uh, Ukraine. In fact, uh, Minister Lavrov repeated that to me today. Uh, but again, we're, we're looking at uh, what is visible uh, to all, and it is uh, deeds and actions, uh, not words that make the difference. I suggested um, to Minister Lavrov, as we have repeatedly, that if Russia wants to um, begin to convince the world that it has uh, no aggressive intent toward Ukraine, uh, a very good place to start would be by de-escalating, by 
uh, bringing back, uh, removing its forces from Ukraine's borders, as well as uh, engaging in, uh, uh, in diplomacy and dialogue, which is what we did today and what we plan uh, to continue doing in the uh, days and weeks ahead. Uh, we've, uh, we've said all along uh, that uh, we intended uh, not only to respond to the concerns that Russia has raised, but to share our own concerns, uh, which are many, about the actions that Russia takes that uh, we see as a threat to security uh, in Europe uh, and uh, indeed beyond. And so it was important in the course of the conversations that we've had to date, Andrea, both uh, last week at the um, uh, strategic stability dialogue between the United States and Russia, at the NATO Russia Council, at the OSC, to make sure that we uh, fully understood each other's positions, each other's concerns. After that, and after consulting uh, very intensely with, uh, with allies and, uh, and partners, um, President Biden wanted uh, me to have this opportunity, having digested what we've heard over the last week, uh, and, maybe, and presumably the Russians having had a, uh, an opportunity to discuss what they'd heard initially uh, from us with President Putin, to really uh, see where we are directly with Foreign Minister Lavrov, uh, to uh, determine whether there is um, a path forward for, for dialogue and for diplomacy. Uh, and then to uh, look at how we would pursue that. And again, what was uh, agreed today, uh, which was that we, we will uh, share uh, with Russia uh, a response to uh, the, con the concerns it's raised, uh, our own concerns, and uh, put some ideas on the table for consideration. And then we plan uh, to meet again after Russia's had a, an opportunity to, um, uh, to, look at, uh, to look at that paper. Uh, and we'll see. Uh, where we go from there. But let me also be clear about this. Um, to the extent that uh, Russia is engaged uh, for now in, uh, in diplomacy, but at the same time continues to take escalatory actions, continues to build its forces on Ukraine's borders, uh, continues to plan uh, for aggressive action against Ukraine, um, we and all of our allies and partners are equally committed to make sure we are doing uh, everything possible uh, to make clear to Russia that there will be, as I said, a swift, severe, and united response to any form of aggression by Russia directed toward Ukraine. Um, finally, let, let me say this. Based on the, the conversation today, Andrea, look, I believe that there are areas where, um, on a reciprocal basis, we can address some of each other's concerns. And they go to things like um, greater uh, transparency in our uh, military activities, um, various uh, risk reduction measures, pursuing arms control, uh, and other ways to build trust that I think would address some of the concerns that Russia's expressed, as well as the many concerns that we have. But it's very important to be equally clear about um, things that we will not do. And one of those is we will not uh, go back on the fundamental principles uh, that, uh, that we have uh, and that we are committed to defend. Uh, and one of those is uh, NATO's open door. Uh, and others include, as I've uh, talked about in, in recent days and in recent weeks, our commitment to the principle that uh, one nation can't simply violate uh, and uh, change the border uh, of another country by force, that it can't uh, propose to uh, dictate to another country its choices, its policies with whom it will associate, uh, and that uh, it can't uh, exert a sphere of influence that would um, subjugate its neighbors to its, uh, its will. We, we're not uh, uh, going to put any of those principles uh, in question. And um, I think Russia understands that very well. So again, based on the conversations we've had over the, the extensive conversations over the past uh, uh, week and today here in Geneva, I think there are grounds for um, and, and a means to address some of the mutual concerns uh, that we have about security. We'll see if, um, uh, if, if that bears out. Uh, and uh, meanwhile, we will continue uh, to prepare resolutely uh, to both paths that we've laid out uh, for Russia, the path of diplomacy and dialogue, or the path of renewed aggression, confrontation, and consequences. Michael Crowley? I, I'm sorry, Andrea, we have very limited time. Michael Crowley? Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I, 
to yes, address that. Um, so on or on, uh, I have to say that uh, Russia uh, shares our sense of, uh, of urgency, uh, the need to uh, see if we can um, come back into mutual compliance uh, in um, the weeks ahead. Uh, and uh, we uh, hope that Russia will use the influence that it has and relationship that it has with Iran to impress upon Iran uh, that sense of urgency. Uh, and equally, that um, if we're unable to do that because uh, Iran uh, refuses to um, undertake the obligations that are, that are necessary, uh, that uh, we will uh, pursue a different path uh, in dealing with the danger posed by uh, Iran's renewed nuclear program, a program that uh, had been put in a box by the uh, agreement uh, that we had reached in the past, the JCPOA, and that unfortunately uh, has now uh, escaped from that box uh, as a result of uh, us pulling out of the agreement and Iran restarting its dangerous program. Michael. Uh, thank you, Secretary Brooklyn. Uh, after four fairly inconclusive meetings uh, between U.S. diplomats and Russian ones, does this process need to move to the presidential level for a breakthrough? Does President Biden need to be speaking to President Putin for uh, progress really to be made here? Uh, and a second question, if I may. In Berlin, you outlined the stakes of this crisis, including the security, of the sanctity of borders and the governing mm -hmm. principles of international peace and security. Mm -hmm. Yet President Biden, several weeks ago, uh, said that uh, the use of American military force is off the table in this situation. Uh, while I'm sure that makes intuitive sense to many Americans for all kinds of reasons, I wonder if you could just explicitly lay out the reasoning why that has been taken off the table. And do you believe the president's statement would still apply even if Russia were to invade Ukraine? Thank you. Um, first, on the, uh, the second part of the, uh, the question. We uh, have uh, made clear uh, and done a number of things uh, in support and uh, in defense of Ukraine uh, that, uh, uh, that will continue. Um, first and foremost, uh, we have worked in very close coordination with allies and partners to develop and make clear to Russia the consequences from renewed aggression against Ukraine. Uh, and that is an important component of deterring and uh, dissuading Russia from engaging in that course. At the same time, we have um, proceeded with uh, providing Ukraine with significant defensive military assistance. In fact, in this uh, year uh, alone, uh, more than uh, at any time uh, since, uh, since 2014, uh, that continues. Allies and partners are doing the same. And finally, we've worked uh, very closely uh, with uh, allies and partners to uh, begin to plan uh, for the reinforcement of NATO uh, itself uh, on its eastern flank in the event of further uh, uh, Russian aggression against uh, Ukraine. Uh, all of these things to make clear to, uh, to Russia the costs and consequences of, um, of its potential actions. We think that's the best and most effective way to convince Russia not to uh, uh, engage in further aggression against Ukraine. Uh, Ukraine is a very valued partner of uh, the United States uh, and uh, other countries in Europe as well. Uh, but our Article 5 commitment uh, extends to NATO allies, something that we are uh, deeply uh, committed to. Uh, Ukraine is not, uh, not a member of NATO. It's not covered by the Article 5 commitment, but uh, a determination to do everything we can uh, to, uh, uh, to defend it and to prevent or deter aggression directed uh, toward it. Uh, and as I said, we will continue all of those efforts uh, in the coming days and coming weeks, even as we test whether uh, the path to a diplomatic resolution is possible. And I'm sorry, the first part of the question Dialogue between the presidents to move Oh, yes. Thank you. Um, what we've agreed today is that uh, we will share uh, in writing next week uh, our, uh, our ideas, uh, our response to concerns that Russia's raised, 
concerns uh, that we have that we will share, again, in, in writing with Russia. Uh, we intend, based on the conversation today, based on uh, that, um, uh, that paper, as well as the paper we received from Russia, to have follow-on conversations after that, um, initially at least at the uh, uh, level of uh, foreign ministers. Um, and if it proves useful and productive for the, uh, the two presidents uh, to meet, to, to, call, uh, to talk, uh, to engage, to try to carry things forward, uh, I think we're fully prepared to do that. Uh, President Biden has uh, met here in Geneva with uh, President Putin. He's um, spoken to him on the phone or via uh, video conference uh, on a number of occasions. Uh, and if uh, we conclude, uh, and the Russians conclude, that uh, per, uh, the best way to resolve things uh, is through a further conversation between them, we're certainly prepared to do that. Ben Hall. Secretary, thank you. Um, I was wondering if, um, as you keep coming back for more dialogue, more talks mm. with the Russians, they continue to act. They continue to mass troops. They continue to destabilize mm. Ukraine. Economically, it's facing a number of hardships. Would you acknowledge the harm they have already done uh, just through their aggressive actions? And in turn, why would you not consider sanctions at this point? There's bipartisan support for them in the US. Ukraine have called for them. Why not? Uh, and then a second question. You said time and time again that the pretext Russia gives for their aggression are false. There's no basis in fact. Mm. I'm curious if Secretary of Foreign Minister Lavrov sits opposite you, looks you in the eye, and tells you effectively, tells you lies to your face. And if so, why humor them with a response? Why humor them with written responses next week, if that's the case? Right. Hey, thanks, Sam. Um, first, uh, again, we're not waiting uh, to take action uh, to counter Russia. As I said a moment ago, we've committed more security assistance to Ukraine in the past year, I think uh, something like $650 million, uh, than at any previous time, uh, going back to 2014, when Russia invaded. Uh, invaded Ukraine. Uh, we're continuing to provide that assistance. We have additional deliveries that uh, are scheduled in the coming weeks. As I noted as well, we've been engaged in extensive diplomacy uh, around the world, rallying allies uh, and partners together in the face of Russian aggression against Ukraine. Uh, yesterday, we announced uh, actions against agents of Russian influence who are operating in Ukraine and who are seeking to destabilize uh, the country. And again, as I've said, we've made it clear to Russia that they would face swift, severe costs uh, to their economy if they move forward with a further invasion of Ukraine, as well as um, the uh, reinforcement uh, of NATO along its uh, eastern flank. Um, we uh, engage in diplomacy and dialogue. That's my, that's my job. Um, but at the same time, uh, we are embarked on a path of defense and deterrence. These things are not mutually inconsistent. In fact, they reinforce each other. So even as we're talking, if the Russians are continuing uh, to escalate and to build up, we are continuing uh, to strengthen everything we're doing in terms of the assistance we're providing to Ukraine for its defense, in terms of the work we're doing uh, at NATO uh, to prepare as necessary to further uh, reinforce the alliance, and uh, continuing uh, to um, define uh, and refine massive consequences for Russia with our allies and partners when it comes to financial, economic, uh, and other sanctions. Uh, so we're, we're doing both at the same time. Now, when it comes to the conversations we have, um, I think the charitable uh, interpretation would be that um, sometimes we in Russia have different interpretations of history. Um, and um, I have to say today, uh, we certainly heard things that um, we strongly disagree with uh, in, terms of, uh, in terms of that history. But by and large, the conversation was not polemical. Uh, it was uh, direct, businesslike, um, and I think in that sense, uh, useful. And uh, it's important to test whether we can, uh, again, resolve these differences uh, through diplomacy and dialogue. That's clearly the preferable way to do it. It's clearly the responsible way to do that, but it's also up to Russia. We'll take a final question from Laurent Burkhalter. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Laurent Burkhalter, uh, Swiss Television, RTS. I wanted to, to talk about the measures that can be taken to de-escalate the situation. Mm. You've mentioned them from both sides. If you could specify them again and tell us an idea of the timeline, how soon it must happen, which comes first, and bigger picture, what do you think the Kremlin wants? this current situation? 
Well, that last question is probably best addressed to President Putin, uh, because in a sense, uh, only he uh, really knows, and I'll, I'll come back to that uh, in a minute. Uh, but again, as I was saying earlier, I think that um, as we've looked at what uh, Russia has, has put forward, as we've listened to uh, what they've said, uh, as we've consulted intensely among uh, allies and partners, uh, as we've looked at our own deep security concerns about actions that Russia takes, not only with regard to Ukraine, uh, but uh, in other places and by other means uh, in, in Europe and beyond, I think it is fair to say that um, there are areas where we believe we can pursue uh, dialogue and diplomacy to see if we can um, find ways to address mutual security concerns uh, on a reciprocal basis that would enhance security for everyone, for, for us, for our European allies and partners, and for Russia. And again, as I suggested earlier, uh, transparency, uh, confidence-building measures, um, military exercises, arms control uh, agreements. These are all things that we've actually done in the past uh, and that, if uh, addressed seriously, um, uh, can, I believe, uh, reduce tensions and address some of, uh, uh, some of the concerns. Uh, but again, that uh, remains to be seen uh, whether uh, we can do that in a, in a meaningful way. And there again, it depends, I think, on, uh, on what uh, Russia actually wants. That is, the, that is the right question. And here's what, uh, what, what is striking to me, and I shared this with, um, with Foreign Minister Lavrov today. Uh, I asked him, from Russia's perspective, to really uh, try to explain uh, to me, to us, how it is they see the actions they've, taking, they've taken uh, as advancing uh, their stated security interests and their broader strategic interests. Because as I said to, uh, to Minister Lavrov, so many of the things that you've done in recent years have precipitated virtually everything you say you want to prevent. Before uh, Russia invaded Ukraine in 2014, seizing Crimea, going into the, the Donbass, um, Russia's favorability ratings uh, in Ukraine were 70 percent. Now they're 25 or 30 percent. Before 2014, before they went and seized Crimea and uh, went uh, into the Donbass, support in Ukraine for uh, joining NATO was 25 or 30 percent. Now it's, uh, it's 60 percent. Um, before 2014, uh, we had been uh, continuing on the, uh, the path of continuing to uh, uh, reduce, while at the same time strengthening uh, our forces in, uh, in, in Europe since the end of the Cold War. Well, uh, what happened after 2014 is NATO felt the obligation, because of Russian aggression, to reinforce its eastern flank. Um, and since 2014, our efforts uh, over many years to convince allies and partners to increase defense spending, well, uh, that succeeded. But I have to say, uh, as much uh, because of uh, Russia and the actions it's taken, as because of anything we've done. So based on Russia's stated strategic interests and concerns, how, has that, how have their actions advanced those concerns? On the contrary, uh, it's gone in the opposite direction from what Russia purports to want. And now, if Russia renews its aggression against Ukraine, uh, the, uh, the outcome will be to simply reinforce the very things, the very trends uh, that Russia expresses a concern about. So uh, I hope that that's something that um, uh, Minister Lavrov reflects on and that President Putin might reflect on as they think about uh, the days and weeks ahead. Thank, Thank you. you.